Hello and welcome to Premier League All Access with me, Sam Matterface, Talk Sports Chief Football Correspondent Alex Crook and Scott Minto, the former Benfica, West Ham, Chelsea and Charlton left back is in the building. Right, what's coming up on this week's Top Show? Darwin Nunez bows out Liverpool and sends a message to Jurgen Klopp. I saw him described as an agent of chaos. Just give him minutes on the pitch and I genuinely think he can he can be one of the top strikers in the Premier League. It was definitely a second yellow, uh, no question about it. I think Trent Alexander-Arnold knows that and probably expects to see the red come out. Tommy Asu gets sent off harshly at Crystal Palace on Monday night and Trent Alexander-Arnold, for a far worse second book of an offence, stays on the pitch. Manchester City still the only team in the league with a 100% record, but boy, were they lucky. I still think they look weaker um, on paper than they did at the end of last season, but they're still winning games, even without Kevin De Bruyne. You look at Manchester United and you can't pick a word that defines their style. Too much of it seems off the cuff. It, it's not great at the moment for United. The, the league table doesn't lie, they say. At the moment, it does. And then there's the Kai Havertz issue, because it seems to me the reason that Arteta has put Partey into the back four is to make room for Kai Havertz. And at the moment, he's offering nothing. He missed one absolute sitter. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of problems for Arsenal. Listen, I hope he plays Partey at right back next weekend. Rashford could have a field day. Ah, hello, gentlemen. Crook is feeling emboldened. Minto's feeling positive about Action Jackson, because Poch has tipped him for big things, the best striker in the world. Uh, and I'm delighted that my outside pre-season pick for Darwin Nunez uh, to be top scorer in the Premier League um, is not only getting goals, but actually getting some action, some minutes. That's really important because he hadn't hardly played up until yesterday. Uh, I'm sure you'll talk Sterling later, Scott, uh, but sum up the Stamford Bridge experience for us in a couple of quick words, because you were in the programme as well, weren't you? Well, I was actually only realised I was in the programme um, at Stamford Bridge a couple of weeks ago against Liverpool where we wore the wrong kit or we had we didn't have a second kit, so we had to wear Coventry's kit, shambles. But to be honest with you, it was just nice to see a, a, Stanford, a Chelsea win at Stamford Bridge because you know, the fans hadn't seen it for a long time. I thought for, for the most of the game, it was a really good performance. Parts where Luton could have got, got back into it, but a, a well-deserved win. Um, Crook, you took Sunday off. Yes, he was so fed up with having to defend the LBG on Saturday. They didn't even turn up for work on Sunday, which was outrageous. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I was struggling to defend him five minutes into the game at Old Trafford. Adrian Durham sat next to me at Arsenal, was having a field day. Peterborough <laughs> winning 1-0, United were 2-0 down. All his Christmases had come at once. Not sure how Peterborough got on in the end. Uh, uh, problems with that nickname, by the way, come from at Kerry on Twitter. Um, Ten Hag isn't little. He is five foot eleven and was a central defender. Uh, he is bald now, yes, but he did have a huge head of hair back in his twenties as a Panini sticker from nineteen ninety three that shows it. Um, but I'm not sure playing the same midfield two games in a row, putting Dallow at left back and starting with Martial helps his case for the moniker genius. Either what you say, Crook. Five foot eleven is short for me, so I'll stand by that. He is bold now. <laughs> And he'll still be a genius come the end of the season. It, it was so funny, actually, because uh, we were talking about this on Saturday. And I was going, five foot 11. Five foot 11 is not um, short <laughs> for anyone apart from Alex Crook. But that's because you're a giant. And Stuart Pearce just turned around and went, Hagrid looks small next to Crook. Um, <laughs> 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 United about to turn down a bid for Harry Maguire, who's uh, been linked with several moves. I've got a, a phone call about this uh, on Sunday night. Um, West Ham have tried again to get his services, but apparently Eric Ten Hag doesn't want to sell him. He doesn't want to sell him for two reasons. Numbers. Luke Shaw's injured. He's going to be injured for quite some while. Uh, Rafa Varane picked up a problem in the game against Nottingham Forest on Saturday. Had to be taken off at half time. Look, Maguire was quite happy to take a pay cut, as far as I understand it, because he wants to play. But West Ham aren't the only club that are interested. Lots of things being suggested at the moment. I think there's a sort of game at play here where Maguire and his agents, they want to get him uh, a move because they want him to play. But at the same time, if Manchester United are going to offer him the chance to play on a more regular basis, then he's quite happy to stay. He was going to take a pay cut to go to West Ham United. But look, now you've got Cucurella um, being offered to Manchester United to solve their left-back problem and Maguire going the other way. That's been muted. Sven Botman is injured, so they might have to do Newcastle going to the transfer market. Um, look, 
The other options are going to Turkey, where Besiktas, Fenerbahce and Galatasaray all need a central defender and have shown an interest. And also Saudi clubs too. And that window is open till the middle of September. So there's still a chance for him to move if indeed he doesn't get the opportunity to do so between now and Friday. But it's going to be a busy, busy week, I think, Crook, for, for you and I. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the left-back situation. Uh, <laughs> Manchester United's list probably includes every left-back ever to have played in the Premier League, apart from Scott Minto, um, with some of the names <laughs> that I've been hearing. But yeah, it is going to be a busy week, Sam. We're uh, we're double-shifting, aren't we, or sharing the load on, on deadline day. Looking forward to it. I think a lot of clubs have still got business to be done. Yeah, looking Sorry, forward to that, it. That, hello? Who's this? Uh, yeah, little ball genius. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. Boots hung up now. Sorry, sorry. He's contracted to us instead. Uh, right, okay. Let's uh, <laughs> look at the weekend. Let's look at uh, take a closer look at the action from the weekend. Darwin Nunez bows out Liverpool and sends a message to Jurgen Klopp. Well, Eddie Howe thought he was cruising when he took off Anthony Gordon and Sandro Tonali, uh, but wow. I've got to be honest with you, that was a big, bad move because that only emboldened Liverpool, didn't it, Crook? Yeah, this is a bad defeat. You know, when when you're playing against 10 men, you've got a 1-0 lead. You just want to see the game out. You're at home. The crowd are invested. Your assistant manager is shushing Jurgen Klopp. That came back to haunt Jason Tindall. I think this is a really bad defeat for, for Newcastle and a real early season setback. Yeah, massive setback because they were leading for a long time, down to 10 men. Uh, Liverpool, did they push hard enough for the second goal, uh, Scott? I think they tried to. I think to be fair, you know, people sort of say, look, when you're down to ten men, you should beat them easily. But uh, an organised ten men, and let's face it, the stats in for quite a lot of that second half, Liverpool weren't even trying to shoot on goal, let alone actually get a shot on target. So it's not easy to break down. Um, I was surprised Anthony Gordon came off, to be honest with you. I thought he was terrorising down the left-hand side and, and Liverpool's right. So I was really surprised and I said that at the time. Um, but, but you know, look, our mate Darwin Nunez, we've we've always tried to champion him, haven't we? And he's a defender's nightmare. And, and in a way, Newcastle probably trying to chase that second goal. It was perfect for him. Yeah, two absolutely sensational strikes from Darwin Nunez. He, I saw him described when I was reading some of the reports of the game as an agent of chaos. And he has got that in his locker. I mean, Scott, he, he, he has got those big finishes in his game, as well as, you know, being a penalty box nightmare. Yeah, that's right. Look, before the Chelsea Luton game, I was on the breakfast show Friday and um, and now actually asked me about Mo Salah. And I said, look, I don't know what they're going to do with money wise, but they've got a lot of firepower there. And they have, we haven't even seen Darwin Nunez, who I think is a, look, he's big, he's strong, he's quick, he can get in behind. And once he gets that extra half a yard, you ain't catching him. It's just a question of getting his shooting boots on. And to be fair to him, he, he was absolutely clinical. On that form, Sam, you know, your shout of, or outside bet, shall we say, of, of t- Premier League's top scorer is, is a good one. I, I've championed him. I want to see him playing. He played for Benfica. He was brilliant there. Just give him minutes on the pitch. And I genuinely think he can he can be one of the top strikers in the Premier League. Um, one clean sheet in 14 Premier League appearances for uh, Newcastle now. That's quite damaging, isn't it? And with Sven Botman injured, that could be a real problem for them, Crook. Yeah, that's a big blow. He, he was such a, a key part of their success last season. I wonder if that's going to have knock-on effects actually for Jamal Lascelles. He himself, I think, has been in talk with uh, clubs over in Turkey about a potential move between, between now and deadline day. I guess they can use Dan Byrne as a centre-back. I think that was a, a plan for this season anyway. Now they've signed Lewis Hall. And I think Matt Target actually is quietly impressed in pre-season. So maybe Byrne will transfer on a more regular basis to his traditional position. But yeah, if, you, if you're conceding goals, it just puts the pressure on, doesn't it, for, for your strikers to deliver? Although I guess you could say that's always been a Newcastle way, isn't it? <laughs> if you go back to the Kevin Keegan days, it was always about outscoring the opposition. So maybe Eddie Howe's just taking a step back in time. Now that's more of what the way that Liverpool have been playing recently, though, isn't it? They've been sort of conceding goals for fun, conceding the first goal in the game on a regular basis and having to fight back, and they did it again yesterday. But they did rely on their goalkeeper, Alisson. He made more saves in the Premier League than he's ever made in a single game uh, before. His stop from Almiron was absolutely terrific, and it was a, a key point in the game, Scott. Yeah, it was absolutely superb. If Newcastle had got that second goal, then Liverpool weren't coming back from that. They weren't. And it was really interesting to hear Jurgen Klopp after the game and him compare, you know, 
there's been some fantastic games in his reign. And he said even with the Barcelona game where they came back from 3-0 down, they genuinely believed they could do it and they were playing at home. Honestly, I don't think there are many... And, and you, interesting you bring out the, the clean sheet stats of Newcastle, but look, the way they play, especially there with the fans, they're big, they're strong, they're intense, they're physical, they give away those little fouls that not only stop the game, but are really annoying. They go out to annoy the opposition in the way they did with Trent at the start. And he was lucky to stay on the pitch, even though it was an initial foul in the first place where he got yeah. the first yellow card. Not many teams will go there and get all three points, I'm telling you, because they are an absolute powerhouse at the moment and so difficult to play against. And that's why I think Jurgen Klopp went a little bit overboard where he said how important that input, that result or performance was for them. It wasn't necessarily a great performance, but it was an incredible result. So let's unpick the, um, the, the sort of difficulties around the yellow cards and the red cards, right? Let's start with, with Trent Alexander-Arnold because you brought him up. Anthony Gordon was having a field day. He is annoying. Right, for, for a start, he is annoying. Little niggly fouls, little elbows, little pushes here and there. He is, but he's really effective and he was incredibly effective for Newcastle United uh, on Sunday afternoon. And Trent Alexander-Arnold didn't really know how to deal with him because he was trying to come in field, trying to play his football, then realised, oh no, I can't do that. He made a terrible mistake for the goal, uh, which Gordon then uh, put away. Uh, and then there was the incident where he got booked for throwing the ball away after being pushed off the pitch by uh, Gordon. And then moments later... He then committed an offence which in any other circumstances would have been a second yellow card. Now, I think John Brooks, the referee, realised that the first yellow card was probably a little bit OTT. As a result of that, he then didn't book him. But that's not necessarily right, is it? If you're going to take this stand when you're going to punish someone for dissent, then the next yellow card, if it is a yellow card, has to be a yellow card. Otherwise, it was pretty pointless booking him in the first place because it's not really a deterrent if everyone knows you're going to get a free one afterwards. Yeah, it undermines what the PGMOL have been trying to do. And we have seen, we talked about it a lot privately, Sam, a, a, an increase in the number of bookings in matches. It was definitely a second yellow. Uh, no question about it. I think Trent Alexander-Arnold knows that and probably expects to see the red come out. And you talk about key moments in the game. Clearly, that was a key moment because if Liverpool go down to nine, they're not going to come back and win, are they? So uh, I think Eddie Howe is right to feel aggrieved about that. And again, and I know you've been... I was going to say bleating on, but I mean, it's a bit harsh over the weekend about the inconsistency when it comes to decision-making. That is another prime example. Tommy Asu gets sent off harshly at Crystal Palace on Monday night and Trent Alexander-Arnold, for a far worse second bookable offence, stays on the pitch. Yeah, I'm not necessarily sure I would equate the two because ultimately, I don't think the Tommy Asu one was harsh because it was a team yellow card. It was, you know, it was nearly 40 seconds or something, wasn't it, by the time that... Um, it was 31 seconds, 23 seconds of, of Havertz delaying a throw in, and then eight seconds of Tommy Asu. And Tommy Asu just happened to be on the end of it, so he got a yellow card. And then he did commit a second offence, which again was slightly pulled the, the, the defender back, but it's a yellow card. So, you know, that that is going to happen. But you're right, it should have happened to Trent Alexander Arnold as well. I mean, ultimately, neither of the first yellow cards should have been given, and then we wouldn't have been in that situation. But that is the diktat from the Premier League. Don't change your mind halfway through. It's like the penalty situations that we've had this weekend. Uh, this idea that if you slide in and the ball hits the, the, your back hand or your, the hand that's supporting you, that should not be a penalty. And then John Egan gets a penalty given against him. It's an absolutely disgraceful decision. However else is he supposed to put his, his, his arm? Uh, what about the red card for Virgil van Dijk? Uh, yes or no? Watching it in, in real time, the first thing I thought was sending off. Scott? Sending off. Crook? Sending off. What's, well, what's the point in asking you? You're a Man United fan. Of course you're going to say that. Um, <laughs> I don't care if he gets the ball or not. Um, he takes the man, which is a, a problem. You can't do that in law. Um, and ultimately, um, that sort of defence has been outlawed for 25 years. So there's the, 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 he got the ball thing is not right. Um, did he did, did he make a foul? Yes. Is he the last man in effect? Is the next action going to be a goal-scoring opportunity? Yes, it definitely is. Therefore, it's a straight red card for Dogso. Yeah, absolutely. There, there can be no argument, really. I mean, he's won the ball, but he's come through the player. It's a foul. It's a goal-scoring opportunity. You can't say it's not, because if the ball was in the... If you'd let it go, the trajectory would be through one-on-one -on -one with the goalkeeper. The, the one thing I just want to say on Trent is... I would have felt sorry for him if he had been sent off just because we talk about those niggly things, which I think Eddie Howe has, has learned from Diego Simeone and, and makes Newcastle <laughs> such a tough team to play against. He pushed Trent in the back. That's a foul. 
it wasn't even a, it was more of a petulant throwback. And I understand that with the yellow card. So with the slightest touch of the second yellow, yes, he should have been given it. But that was a disgraceful decision in the first place that it wasn't a foul in the first place. So I would have had some sympathy for him. But yeah, they could easily have gone down to nine men. Yeah, well, I remember uh, breaking the story that Eddie Howe had uh, been in Madrid whilst he was on uh, sabbatical from uh, sort of uh, his his managerial career. And everyone was thought, oh, brilliant, he's gone to watch Real Madrid and he's having a good look at the way they, they formulate their training sessions. The most he learned actually was when he went to see Atletico Madrid and spent time on the training ground with Diego Simeone <laughs> and learned how to disrupt. And they've done it very, very well, uh, by the way. Uh, talking of disrupting and doing very well, Sheffield United won Manchester City 2. Oh, Manchester City still the only team in the league with a 100% record. But boy, were they lucky because they too were disrupted, roughed up, had a real tussle at Bramall Lane Crook. Yeah, fair play to Sheffield United. Um, I did their game at Forest uh, the week before and I said they showed character and, and spirit in the second half of that game. and They showed it in abundance in this one. Such a cruel twist at the end with Rodri coming up with yet another important goal for Man City. They weren't at their best, Sam, but as you say, they are the only team in the league with a 100% record. Usually, if you're going to catch City cold, you do it at the start of the season. So I think this is pretty ominous for the rest of the Premier League. And Erling Haaland showed he was human after all with that missed penalty that cost us all points, uh, I would guess, in the fantasy football states because we all had him as captain, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, and you know, the good news is, is that because I used my wild card this week, I couldn't triple captain him, which was my plan at the beginning of the week. Um, so, which I was quite happy about when he missed the penalty and got me minus two points because that would have been minus six points and that wouldn't have been very helpful. Um, Scott, how much do you think yesterday's result performance from Manchester City was down to the fact that Sheffield United played so well from a really dogged and well-organised Paul Heckingbottom getting them quite well-versed? And how much do you put it down to City being off the pace? Look, I, I think I think whatever we say about Sheffield United and, and what he's had to deal with, Hecky, in terms of the players that he's lost and, and they're probably going down, Bramall Lane is is a fantastic place to go in terms of the atmosphere that will be there. And they'll they'll gain them a few points. That, that it's on the box, they're against the best team. They are giving absolutely everything for it. And City probably is human nature to go, look, we're, we're, we're going to a team that we think we're going to beat quite easily and probably will go down then it can level up a little bit. Look, City was still by far and away the better side and in control of the game. But Sheffield United tactics were spot on. Try and stay in the game as long as possible. See if you can nick an equaliser down the end. Yes, you still need to rely on City missing chances and Haaland missed not just the penalty, but a few others as well. Um, and you could definitely say it's really harsh in them to, to, to concede that last minute goal from Rodri. But that's what champions do. They find a way to win, even if they're not at it. And that's another three points. I still think once the sort of international um, or the Champions League sort of comes in, that's where we'll see from the mental side, this side of Christmas, uh, how Man City gets on if they are to drop points. If they're not to drop points from sort of September to Christmas, then they're going to absolutely run away with this. They do look as if they're missing the incision of Mares and the gall of uh, Gundogan. Um, um, do you think they'll be busy in the transfer market between now and Friday? They, they've signed Jeremy Doku, haven't they? And he was straight onto the bench on Sunday. Yeah, I think he'll bring that guile that you're talking about. I think Mateus Nunes inevitably will happen. Gary O'Neill, Wolves manager, said it himself after their win at Everton that once Man City come calling, it's very difficult uh, to persuade a player to stay. Obviously, they're going to have to agree a package with Wolves. I would expect uh, Tommy Doyle on loan at Sheffield United actually last season to move in the opposite direction. Um, and I think that probably will be it. I think if they get the Nunes deal done, as you mentioned, Doku already, then that will conclude the summer business. I still think they look weaker um, on paper than they did at the end of last season, but they're still winning games, even without Kevin De Bruyne. So, so if they sign Matthias Nunes, which is what we think will happen now, what does that mean for Calvin Phillips? I wouldn't be surprised if he was to move um, between now and, and uh, the deadline. We talked, myself and Jim White, a couple of weeks ago that Liverpool w were showing some interest and that possibly City were willing to send him out on loan. I think if that's the case, you're going to have half the Premier League who want to sign Calvin Phillips because you have to think back to how pivotal he was, not just for Leeds as they came up from the Championship and established themselves for a couple of years in the Premier League, but for England, that European Championships as well. I think like Maguire... I think Phillips, in a year where there's a major tournament at the end of the season, 
he needs to be going out and playing. The fact City looks so light at the start of this season and Phillips still isn't getting any minutes. I think it's a pretty big indication that he's not going to do a Jack Grealish and he's not going to prosper in the second season under Guardiola. We'll see what happens with him. Burnley were beaten at home by Aston Villa. They, their wait for a win goes on, but this is only their second game of the season because their uh, middle game was actually postponed because of the trip to Luton uh, being uh, pushed back because of renovation work. Uh, Villa recovered well from their opening day, drubbing a Newcastle. Two back-to-back wins now. DRB played well, shrewd signing, got a goal. Uh, but Pau Torres made another mistake for the goal, didn't he, Scott? Yeah, he did. And look, it's a, it's going to be a fast learning curve for him. Um, we know Tyron Mings is out for a long time. And, and look, he's a good player. He's, oh, he's certainly very good on the ball, but he's going to have to learn in terms of the Premier League, the pace and intensity and the lack of time you get. And just the reading of the game, just to be, you know, it, it looks like he needs to sort of go into the gym for a couple of weeks and actually strengthen up and realise what the Premier League is all about. But look, what I would say is, Villa have bounced back really well and they do look strong and they are looking as if they're a team that I believe will, will win a European competition this year. And also, if they are able to combine it, you know, it was interesting because Martinez was out, wasn't he? And, and I think that's a big drop to Olsen. Yeah. Yet in this particular game, it didn't matter too much. Um, and if Ollie Watkins gets injured as well, how are they going to do there? So there's key players they need to keep fit. But Burnley were taught a lesson into how to counter-attack and what the Premier League is all about. And I'm really pleased with Matty Cash as well. Not many full-backs get two in a game, so pleased for him. Ever done that yourself? No. Not you get two I in a season. And, oh, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I resemble, I mean, resent that remark. <laughs> um, it was his Sorry, Crookie, you played... And, and Crookie, you played for who, was that? I played for the sirloin of beef. He played for a couple, a couple, a couple of uh, a couple of charity games, yeah, in the sirloin of beef down in Southsea, um, and he was uh, often, of he, he was often de- deployed as my central defensive partner, which is like, really weird. And he would uh, he <laughs> he would just rampage up the field and just do what he liked. He just couldn't be couldn't be bothered. And I'd be like, where where did you go? Where did you go? He's like, well, It'd be know. like Hagley just, just running up the, 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 the field, wouldn't he? Just moving everyone, blocking everyone out of the way. Oh, and uh, no, You gave a foul about 10 seconds ago, Crookie. Stop the game, pick up the ball and come back to your position. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's talk about Burnley because, um, listen, have they made too many signings? Is that possible to do? The team sheet comes out and you're like, who are these people? I, I spoke to my Burnley mate um, yesterday and I said, what was your, what's your takeaway from the game? And he went way too open got done in midfield, taught a lesson on the counter-attack. Aston Villa just a little bit sharper and quicker than us. And there's just too many newbies. I mean, Delcroix, who played at left-back, um, it was his first appearance for Burnley, signing from, from Belgium football. And he had to, <laughs> he had a really tough time with Matty Cash, didn't he? I mean, it was a, it was a baptism of fire uh, for him. But you look at that team and you just think, that doesn't even look like the team that came up last year. I know that Bayer was injured yesterday. They've lost Teller, obviously. He's gone back to Southampton and now gone on uh, to Leverkusen. Um, but, you know, they took off Manuel Benson at half time to try and stiffen up um, one of those sides. But it just didn't It just didn't work. And I just think, can you? You've got Vincent Company. You've got loads of credit in the bank because you won the, the, the championship with a brilliant style of football. But ultimately, coming into the Premier League, it's slightly different. And you probably need just a little bit somewhere, a little bit more experience. I'm looking at that team and the Premier League experience that you're getting from that team is Dara O'Shea, who played probably a handful of games in the Premier League for West Bromwich Albion. And Sander Berger, that's about it really, isn't it? I mean, there's not Connor Roberts, obviously. Sorry, I should have mentioned him. That's that three players out of the starting eleven that have played Premier League football before. I'm not sure that's enough, especially with the age profile of the other players that are in that team, Scott. And Sam, you, you look at the, the fixtures coming up as well. They've got, obviously, they've got the, the Caraba Cup, but they've got Tottenham at home, Forest away, which I think would be a big one, Manchester United at home and Newcastle away. You know, they need to be careful. You know, at the end of that, that they, they might not still have a win. And you're absolutely right. You know, that it, it, it's such a big jump from the Championship to the Premier League. If you're going to bring lots of players in and suddenly say, well, look at the talent they've got, you lose a little bit of the soul of what you had with the championship um, while waiting for people to actually come in and get used to it and get used to their surroundings as well. So, look, it's still early days for me. I'm not going to turn around and say Burnley are in trouble, but 
at the end of September, you know, none of us in pre-season said that we thought they would go down. By the end of September, if they still haven't got a win, you've got to start thinking they, they will be struggling this season. Uh, they won't be the only ones uh, struggling. There's quite a few teams that look as if they were doing that on Saturday. So let's have a look at Saturday's action, starting with a chaotic game at Old Trafford. Live on TalkSport. Well, first of all, should we have some house rules, Scott? Right? Okay, let's have some, some house rules. Crook, you're not allowed to get grumpy, okay? It's just a football <laughs> match. We don't want you getting all upset with us and not talking to us. You know, he's he's you should have seen him on Saturday night. Oh, dear. He, 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 someone goes fishing in one of our WhatsApp groups and he bites and he starts he starts chirping back. He gets all irate. And then he texts me on the side saying, who doesn't understand this? He doesn't understand that. You haven't seen this. You haven't seen this. <laughs> he gets really, really upset. Uh, so so just, don't, just try and just cool your temper just for a second. Now, because I knew that we would have such an intense discussion about all of this, I thought it was only prudent to go back and watch the entire 90 minutes from Saturday's game between Manchester United and Nottingham Forest. Um, in fact, it wasn't 90 minutes. It was 106 minutes. Um, I then discussed it with our co-commentator, Dean Ashton, who was there uh, for Talk Sport. Uh, and these are my key takeaways. Are you ready to hear them? Are you ready to hear them? Crook, are you okay to hear this? I think I've already heard them, but go on. <laughs> it sounds like he's bored. I haven't, Sam. I'm ready. Okay, I'm pleased, Scott. Right, here we go. Um, look, there's none of the, the, the fluidity or the coherent patterns of play that you see with someone like Arsenal, Manchester City, even Brighton with Manchester United. You look at Manchester United and you can't pick a word that defines their style. Too much of it seems off the cuff. Is that fair, Crook? Yeah, and I think that's probably summed up actually not by the fact they conceded twice in the first five minutes, but by the way they managed the game so poorly when they actually took the lead um, and Forrest had a player sent off. They still did their best to let Forrest back in the game and, and did their best to chuck away two points. Tactically, I think they are so indisciplined and naive as well. I mean, how on earth are you conceding from a corner in the first 57 seconds of a game? Well, I'll tell you why. Because you've decided to leave Anthony and Rashford as your two deepest players and not anticipated that the ball might, for a moment, be cleared. And you've got Taiwo Awonyi, who is probably one of the hottest strikers in the Premier League at this moment in time, on the leash. And he is absolutely rapid as well. Terrible decision. I don't understand that. Why would you why would you have Rashford and Anthony as your two sort of back markers when you're attacking a corner? Seems very strange. Tracking back, not coordinated. They don't press with cohesion. The best they did that was at Spurs in the first half when Fernandez and Mount and Rashford all went together. But in the game on uh, Saturday against Nottingham Forest, you got Bruno Fernandez pressing and then realizing that nobody else is bothering to do it. I mean, Anthony, he divides opinion. I know that yesterday they put a, a video up on me uh, for Talk Sports saying that I was scathing about him. I don't think I was scathing about him. I was saying that for £80 million, I probably expect a little bit more end product. And I don't see enough of that. This is a guy that can't cross or pass with his right foot. He actually only has one trick, which is to cut in on his left and then try and bend it into the far corner. He can dribble. He can run. Yes, I understand that. But, you know, if these end product is limiting, limited to that unleashing of a, a, of a shot with his left foot after cutting in, then it's quite predictable for a defender. And he is the last to start running back. When a move breaks down, inevitably half the time it's with him, he never gets back to help out. The good news is they've got Bruno Fernandes, who is absolutely terrific. 4.33 shots per 90, 3.33 key passes per 90, XG of 2.21, XG per 90 of 0.75. How frustrating it must be for him to deliver those sort of numbers, Scott, and yet still not have anyone around you with the sort of level of quality that's required to put the ball in the back of the net. Martial not fit, shouldn't be playing. Rashford's body language is gone again. Uh, F Fernandes... I mean, without him pressing, everybody else is sort of looking around going, what? I don't understand what's going on here. And his key passes, I don't know where they'd be. Yeah, look, I mean, it's, it, he comes under a lot of criticism at times. Is he a, a good enough leader? But I, I can't think of a, a better captain for Manchester United, which perhaps sums up really why United are still a million miles off Manchester City. In terms of going forward, he, he does what you ask him to do in that attacking midfield player. And yes, he wants to try and uh, press as well. But if everyone's not doing it, and that's where the manager has to take responsibility because you're not seeing it. You're right about you look at other teams and you can see what the tactics are and what you know the process is meant to be. 
with United, you can't see it at the moment. Rashford's gone out on the left. You thought that he'd absolutely star, you know, showed moments of brilliance, but nothing more than that. Martial, well, he, he's not a United player in my book. And, and Anthony, I think, I always try to give someone a season, but he started this season. I don't see a change. He was very unlucky with one particular moment, but I think there's a lot of issues there at, at United. I said it last week, and you're up against the team that was the worst away side last season. You can you can see two early goals and you just about nick a win. It, it's not great at the moment from United. The, the league table doesn't lie, they say. At the moment, it does. That's cheered me up. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> j- just on Anthony, and you're right, he was underwhelming last season. And, and I said over the summer, same as Scott, give him a bit of time. He's, he's 21 years of age. He's South American. Sometimes South American players can take their time to adapt. What I liked about Anthony at the weekend, as much as he was... He was poor in possession at times and his decision-making still wasn't great. And yes, lack of end product. But at least he still wanted the ball. At least he doesn't go hiding. He's clearly got good character. He's got a good mentality and he wants to succeed. I think he will get there. So I'm going to step my neck out. I think I think by the end of the season, hopefully, hopefully a lot sooner than that, we're going to be talking about a different player. Well, when he was at Ajax, I thought he was terrific. I mean, he was, he, he was a, a great player. And I think Eric Ten Hag sort of thought he was getting that level of player when he when he brought him in. But ultimately, it's very different level of quality from the uh, Dutch league to the Premier League. And you have to have a little bit more guile. You can't be as one-footed as him and be worth 80 million quid. I'm sorry. I mean, unless you're Bernardo Silva, which is, you know, you're constantly producing performance after performance. And he's not doing that just yet. But like you say, look, uh, he's only 21. Let's see what happens with him. Let's hope that he ends up producing over the course of the season. But let's talk about... Manchester United's overall situation here because Eric Ten Hag has got to be accountable for this, right? Because he is the one that sets the team up. He is the one uh, that uh, sends them out with a tactical plan. He is the one that picks the players and signs the players. It has to improve pretty quickly, Crook, because otherwise Arsenal will gobble them up next Sunday. Yeah, this is a problem. Um, I'm at the game on Sunday for your for your Sunday session. <laughs> Can't say I'm particularly looking forward to it from a United perspective because their away record against the the top six, the so-called big six, is lamentable. They're going to have to be a lot more tactically disciplined. I didn't think Arsenal were great against Fulham, but they'll improve, I'm sure, for this game. So let's hope that Manchester United can find a, a new level of performance. Interesting to see what he does with Rasmus Hoyland. Scott's right, there's a lot of pressure on a player who's only really had one year in Serie A because he's got to come in and really be the focal point for this team. Because let's be honest, Anthony Martial is a complete waste of space. How that bloke has got to 300 Manchester United appearances is beyond me. He's probably played well about 12 times in those three centuries of games. He's an absolute no-hoper. Um, let's talk about the most controversial decision of the weekend, the VAR, the penalty that got Manchester United all three points and the sending off of Joe Worrell. Start with the uh, uh, the reaction from Steve Cooper, who is not happy about it at all. Maybe with the sending off, um, I think it's debatable if Worrell was the last man. A lot has been made of the penalty. Some people have said that Rashford dived. I don't necessarily see it like that. I think he's running at full pelt. I think there was contact. I think when you're running at that speed, there is enough contact to go down. I think based on what we've seen over the last couple of years since VAR was introduced into the Premier League, I think it was a penalty. I certainly don't think there was enough for VAR to overturn the on-field decision. Stuart Atwell obviously was the referee and he gave a penalty straight away. I think once he'd given the penalty, it's not going to be overturned. I've watched it from several different angles. I've slowed it down to, to half speed. I think when you look at it in slow motion, it does look like a dive. But actually, if you watch it at full pelt, and I've watched it from a different angle, the other side, the so Alex Ferguson stand, um, and you see him running into the box, the reverse angle, and the, the way that Danilo sort of comes across him, because there is a little bit of contact, it does immediately take his legs away. I don't think there's enough for him to go down as dramatically as he did. I do think he's overplayed here, but I think once that decision has been given by the referee, there's no clear and obvious evidence to overturn it, which is the key factor, really. The sending off is not a sending off because it's not the denial of a goal-scoring opportunity. Why is it not the denial of a goal-scoring opportunity? Fernandez wasn't going to get there. The ball was running off the turf too quickly and was going straight into the arms of the goalkeeper. Willie Bolly was very, very close to it. So it's not a clear opportunity to score a goal with the next action, which is the criteria that needs to be applied. So will it get overturned? I'm not going to say yes or no, because as last weekend with the McAllister one, you asked me the same question. I said, I don't know. 
I, I can't tell you whether or not they think that's a red card or not. I can just tell you what the, the guidance is. And it did get overturned. So look, look good. hopefully for Steve Cooper and for, for Joe Worrell, it does, but we'll, we'll see. We must big up Taiwo Awonyi, who scored seven goals in seven Premier League games, but his total is a lot um, bigger than that over the course of the piece. I think now it's, what, something like nine or, or, or ten goals in seven, something like that. It's really, I mean, it's an absolute cracking run of form from him. And he's hot property. He was at Union Berlin and scored a quite a few goals. And we thought, would that translate to the Premier League? Well, it didn't for the first half, but it certainly did the latter half of it. And he was at Liverpool as a trainee as well. Um, so you know, Steve Cooper's known about him for a long time. And he's a real handful, Scott. Well, we were at uh, the Emirates, weren't we, when he came off the bench and, and along with Alanga sort of changed the game and suddenly made Arsenal's fans you know, have put, not just go from their feet up to their feet down, but stand on their feet and start having a go at the, the players. He is quick. He is powerful. He's got similar attributes to, to Darwin Nunez. And the fact that he's been at Liverpool, the fact that he has shown already he's he's got glimpses of, actually, defenders can't live with him at times. But it also shows an inconsistency that with the greatest respect, he's still a Premier League player right now, but he's with a, a, a team that is trying to stay away from relegation. If he can do this on a consistent basis, then I'm telling you now, bigger clubs will be coming back. Because um, I, I wouldn't want to play against him. I know that. Arsenal 2, Fulham 2. Uh, we spoke about Arsenal's tactical tweak with Party going from right back into midfield. It was their undoing after about, well, I think it was less than a minute, wasn't it? 57 seconds or something when uh, uh, Arsenal ended up conceding uh, to Fulham. Um, but was their passive front four more of the problem, Crook? I think it was a combination of both, to be honest. Just because Pep Guardiola has played that inverted fullback coming into midfield doesn't mean every other manager has the tools to follow suit. And I think by playing Partey at right back and not Ben White there, he's broken up what was a key partnership for Arsenal last season. William Saliba and Gabriel, uh, no surprise that when either of those were injured towards the end of the campaign, their form tailed off. So I don't understand the Gabriel situation. Going forward, it was a bit of a mess, to be honest. He played Trossard in a false number nine. Arsenal fans will say, well, he's done that before. Never worked when Trossard played as a false number nine and the Graham Potter at Brighton. So I'm not sure it's going to start working now. And then there's the Kai Havertz issue, because it seems to me the reason that Arteta has put Partey into the back four is to make room for Kai Havertz. And at the moment, he's offering nothing. He missed one absolute sitter. There was another brilliant opportunity for him a few minutes after that miss when Saka put a great ball into the box and he just didn't attack the space because he isn't a natural centre forward. So, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of problems for Arsenal. Like, listen, I hope he plays Partey at right back next weekend. Rashford could have a field day. Yeah, what, what's happened to Gabriel as well? He was the mainstay of the defence last year. And by doing this weird tactical tweak, he seems to, uh, Arteta, have sort of peed him off too. Is he overcomplicating it, Scott, from your point of view? Or is this a guy who is trying to actually make this team better by using different tactical innovations? Yeah, I, I, that's exactly what he's trying to do. I mean, he would have worked under Pep where he would have won a title and Pep's still looking to try and do something different. And you, a lot of people would be saying, well, well, why? Because you've just won the title. And he's saying, well, that's what we've got to do to try and stay ahead of the rest. I don't actually have a problem with Parse playing right back because generally speaking, Arsenal will have the majority of the possession and therefore you want that kind of extra man in midfield. But I do agree with Crookie. He's almost playing there to play Kai Havertz. Now, Sam, we've spoken about Kai Havertz on many occasions. He scored some fantastic, important goals for Chelsea, but never really cemented himself as a, as a proper first-team Chelsea player. And, and the fans weren't unhappy that he left. That is a problem. In terms of Trossard, I don't know why he didn't stay with um, Nketiah. Nketiah, I think, just needs a run of games. His movement at the start of the season was absolutely brilliant. He just needs that bit of confidence. And yeah, I get the fact that Trussell can play there, but play in Ketia, play your goal scorer. That's what we've been saying they needed. Instead of buying a Kai Havertz, buy a, a proven goal scorer. And Ketia is the best finisher they have at the club. Yeah, and he's already scored goals this season. They played three games. He scored two goals. He had two cracking chances against Crystal Palace. Yes, he didn't finish them. I totally get that. But he's finishing more chances than anybody else in that team. Um, so give him give him a run. Give him an opportunity. His goals to game record, his goals to starts record, is quite startling. It's pretty impressive. Just on the tactical tweak and the, and the Thomas Partey thing. Everyone's saying, oh, yeah, but, but Pep Guardiola did it. So that's why Arteta's doing it. Pep Guardiola didn't do it. He, he, well, he did do it. He doesn't do it anymore. 
he learned after about four or five games, actually, that that wasn't really the, the best way of doing it, bringing the inverted right back into the centre of midfield. He actually, towards the end of last season, abandoned that probably about March time. He started it in February, and by March, he was already moving on to something else. And that something else was pretty simple. It was a real quick switch. He basically put Walker back at right back, Stones was playing in central uh, defence and moving into midfield because Guardiola actually realised that coming from the right side and into the centre left you more vulnerable to the left winger. And actually, if you're the central defender and you want to get into central midfield, it's a quicker route to go five, six yards forward than it is trying to travel from that right back position, getting back into the middle and then trying to get back out again when you lose the ball. So Arteta actually hasn't followed through the whole process of what Guardiola actually did probably be better having Ben White travel from centre-back into midfield because Ben White can do that. He played there for Leeds United. No, no, you're right. But at the same time, if you're going to play Carl Walker and you always want to be playing Carl Walker, he's not your your typical go into midfield. But he left him that, out. That of, like, but he left pardon? him out. He, he was leaving him out. He was leaving Walker out to play Stones at right back and he was playing an extra, extra central defender and Stones was coming into midfield. Then he changed it put Stones back in the centre of defence, left out a central defender and brought Walker back in for that reason, that you want Walker in the side. Yeah, absolutely. You want Carl Walker in the side and he left him out at different times, but you want Carl Walker in the side. And the majority, I mean, I'm surprised, he didn't. was it the Champions League final or I can't remember what it was where he didn't play and I was really surprised that he didn't. But the bottom line is, yes, you're right. It's much easier to, to step in and step out from the central position but if Rico Lewis is going to play, I bet you he'll be the one coming into midfield as well, rather than, you know, John Stones. It, it's just with Pep, it's just a complete change. He's always wanting to keep uh, opposition managers guessing. He's always trying to do something different. And yeah, absolutely. Arteta's one step behind. I don't see an, a, a problem. There are individual mistakes that they're conceding goals. They shouldn't be conceding in the first minute. You're wanting to actually make sure that you have as much possession as possible. And, and maybe we'll see in a couple of months Ben White stepping up from, from centre-half into centre-midfield. Let's, let's wait and see. Um, it'd be a big game, though, won't it? It'd be a really big game on Sunday. Arsenal against Manchester United, looking forward to that. Um, Fulham did well. Their shape was really good at times. I think, you know, Paulinho makes a massive difference to them when he's, he's playing. And I think he, they'll, they'll have a reasonable season, I think. Uh, but I don't know if they'll do any business between now and the end of the window, but they're certainly uh, in good shape. They play on Tuesday night live on Talk Sport 2 against Tottenham Hotspur at home in the Carabao Cup. I'm looking forward to that. I'm going to go to that one. Brighton won West Ham United 3. Brighton losing their 100% record. Uh, but it was the archetypal uh, David Moyes performance, wasn't it? Sit, soak, strike. And boy, did they strike. They created a lot of chances actually on the breakaway and could have probably scored more goals, uh, West Ham United. It was a bit, of, a bit of a lesson, I think, this for Brighton's Crook. Yeah, maybe just dampen some expectations after a really good start of the season. But then you take into account, actually, they played Luton and Wolves, two of the sides who were going to be scrapping against relegation. This was their first big step, big test, and they fouled it. I mean, you, you look at the stats and actually Brighton played well. Uh, but as you say, when it came to the counter-attacks, they just couldn't deal with West Ham. I felt Adam Webster in particular had a really torrid afternoon. Not sure why De Zerbe changed the goalkeeper. We're hearing potentially, I mean, I think he said it on record that he will do that over the course of the season so that both goalkeepers get minutes. Not sure that really works. I think you have to have a designated number one. But from a West Ham perspective, after a pretty turbulent summer when a lot of us were tipping David Moyes maybe to be the first manager to depart, they've had a brilliant start to the season. And you look at the signings they've made, Alvarez comes in and, and has a really impressive full debut. James Will Prowse, two assists last week, a goal this. They're still looking to strengthen between now and the end of the window. They've got Kudos coming in, who's a really exciting player. So maybe West Ham can surprise us and challenge for Europe again. I think it's Kudos, isn't it? It's not Kudos. I think Kudos is probably... I mean, kudos to West Ham for getting him, but I, I don't think we can call him Kudos. <laughs> <laughs> um, but kudos to um, Alvarez and uh, the West Ham social media team who who put up a, a a reel over the weekend of Alvarez balletic turns inside his own box under pressure and a great smooth passes to the soundtrack of Sade's smooth operator, which I thought was <laughs> was, was quite uh, was quite apt. Although I'm sure there's quite a few kids watching that on reels because I imagine the the target audience for a reel is probably about sort of 16 to 24. They're probably going, 
who's Sharda? Doesn't he play on the left of the front three for, for Brentford? Um, <laughs> right. Um, what, what about Ward Prowse? Looking like an inspired bit of business. First goal off the back of two assists last week, Scott. You must be pleased with what West Ham have done in terms of their response to what was, as Crook has already pointed out, quite a chaotic summer. Absolutely, yeah. I was with Adrian in, in, in the show last Wednesday and saying that, you know, what's going to happen to, to Moise? You win a European trophy, you've only got a year left, your contract doesn't get renewed, you're in a battle allegedly with the uh, the managing director or director of football as to what type of way you want to go. This was the perfect start because if it hadn't have started well, then I think there are West Ham fans who are not happy with him, despite what happened. So this is absolutely perfect start and the tactics were... Just what David Moyes won. I mean, I didn't see it coming, I'll be honest with you, because West Ham have a terrible record against Brighton. But almost Brighton were the perfect side in that sense for the way they wanted to play, that 4-1, 4-1. I thought Alvarez was superb. You're right, Crookie. I thought Mikel Antonio just had Adam Webster on toast the whole game. And James Ward-Prowse, you know, that goal that he scored, it came from him in the first place, just screening, playing the ball in the channels, following it, gambling, and what happened? He scores and, and, and the rest is history in that. So it's been an absolutely perfect start so far in his West Ham career. And I think he's a really underrated player. And if he has a really good uh, season, both in the Premier League and the Europa League, then why can't he kick into the, the Euro squad come the end of the season? Mm, interesting. He always gets left out when he gets to the crunch, though, doesn't it, James Will Prowse? And he, he's always very disappointed about it. And uh, I understand why. Bournemouth nil, Spurs two. Spurs were very impressive. I was down at the Vitality Stadium for this one. Once they rode out the first 10 minutes of that incredibly aggressive Bournemouth press, um, they were more threatening than ruthless than Bournemouth, which was a problem for Ariola's side. Um, their XG of 2.06 compared to Bournemouth's 0.67 sort of highlights that. But Billing should have scored before half time, and actually the game swung on the second goal because in the first 15 minutes of the second 45, Bournemouth had been dominating. They switched off. The dog kept the ball in down by the left channel, and and then there was no no way back. But James Madison, I mean, look, listen, he is he's got a great attitude. He's got brilliant application. He's been good off the pitch. He's been brilliant on the pitch. He took complete control of that game, popping up all over the place grabbing, wanting the ball. I mean, look, with performances like that, there's no wonder he's got a mural of himself inside his own executive box at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. <laughs> yeah, listen, I, I maybe went a bit bold in the uh, the preview show that we did at Wembley by suggesting that there were comparisons between James Madison and Gaza, but I meant more that he's taken the number 10 shirt. He's the type of flair player that Tottenham fans will love watching. And he just looks like he was born to play for Spurs. And sometimes when a player leaves a lesser club and, and joins a, a bigger club, that the weight of expectation can affect their performances. He's done the opposite for Madison. I think he's playing just about as well as he has done at any point in his career. Obviously, Harry Kane left, which would have been a disappointment for him, but he's he's really stepped up to become Tottenham's talisman. And I've got to say, I love Ange Postacoglu. When he was asked in the press conference afterwards, is Madison at 45 million one of the bargains of the season? And he said, 45 million a bargain, mate? I don't know what world you're living in. And it was just a brilliant reply. Sorry about the rubbish Australian accent, but I love him. I think he's great. <laughs> Scott, I don't think we should allow uh, Crook to uh, emigrate down under any time soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was quite interesting when we spoke to him afterwards. We said to him, uh, can you can you see over, after a couple of weeks sort of, your team taking shape. How far are you away uh, from the uh, the Tottenham Hotspur that you expect to see under Ange Postecoglou? And he just went, "Mate, you can't see as far away as that." And that was it. <laughs> He's okay. brilliant, isn't he? Uh, it was quite blunt and fun. It was, you know, all right, fair enough. He's absolutely brilliant. A lot better than an attempt of an Ameri uh, Australian accent. Anyway, was it? It might have been American. I don't know. <laughs> what was um, it? What was it? Oh yeah, mate. <laughs> Do you know what? He is an absolute breath of fresh air for Spurs after what's happened with Conte and Mourinho. And, you know, there's not just the style of football, but the way he is. I mean, I personally have not met a bad Aussie. I, th I just think they're, they're absolutely brilliant. And the, the mentality of the way they want to win. And you know what? When he first came into British football, people didn't give him the, a lot of respect. He certainly earned the respect now. And, you know, the Tottenham fans are singing, we've got our Spurs back, aren't they? So, Absolutely so far so good. But again, he knows that they're still a million miles away from where they want to be. Madison, I think, is absolutely key for, for Spurs this season. The fact he's been willing to take Kane's shirt number, uh, I think, shows the confidence he's got in himself. But it's a cheeky confidence. It's not an out, it's not an out sort of really bad arrogance. 
So, yeah, imagine if him and Harry Kane were linking up together on a regular basis, then there's a bit, so be even more goals. I, I'm sure there would be. Um, OK, he's not the only one, though, that um, is the, the Tottenham fans aren't the only ones that are singing about Ange Postacoglu. In fact, uh, their, their catchy little ditty uh, to the uh, theme of uh, Angels by Robbie Williams is really catching on. And through it all, we'll play the way we want to With Big Ange Postacoglu Whether I'm right or wrong it's big and bold, so you can keep your Potticino, Conte and Mourinho, and even Christian Gross. Cause everywhere we go, I'm loving big and instead. Guess I'm a Spurs fan now then. There's something quite tragic about that, about Robbie, who, who's, I'm sure, a, a Port Vale fan, a season ticket holder at Chelsea and a, a box holder at Manchester United, uh, <laughs> singing for Spurs. I mean, now, come on, Rob, Robbie, you're not a Spurs fan. No, uh, he's, he's not. He's a, I think he's a Manchester United fan, really. Uh, but he's, yeah, he's a good lad and he's good fun. And um, he's obviously um, impressed the Tottenham fans uh, with that, uh, but it's the only thing. I, I, the only thing I will say about it, right? And I'm listen. I'm all for it. I think it's great. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll catch on. Right. They've played three games under this guy, right? And he's now like the new messiah. It reminds me a lot of like Chelsea fans reacting when Antonio Conte um, took over Chelsea and they beat Manchester United, and everyone was booing Mourinho when he came back with United to, to Stamford Bridge. And I was like. Guys, this guy's won three titles for you. This guy's been here three minutes. Let's just be a little bit cautious. I know it's been a bad time for Spurs fans, so and those guys did nothing for them. So I understand why you're investing in him. But at the same time, let's just calm it down a little bit. Let's not get too exciting. If it all goes wrong, that song's out the window very, very quickly. Uh, right, let's get to uh, let's get to the rest of uh, Saturday's football, and uh, we we should probably talk about the Toffees who are in a sticky patch. Good win for uh, Maurizio Pochettino on Friday night. 3-0 winners over uh, Luton. Raheem Sterling was terrific. And uh, Nicholas Jackson scored his first goal. Afterwards, uh, they said that, uh, I think it was Poch who said, he's going to be one of the best strikers in the world. But all the talk was about Raheem Sterling. We've been bigging him up uh, on this podcast. And the first day of uh, the season, I was suggesting that he's going to have a great season um, because he just looks in much finer fettle. And the fact they've done that weird Clark's advert, uh, and it shows how comfortable he is in his own skin. Um, he's happy, he's relaxed, and that means good season, I hope, for him. So congratulations to him and to Chelsea. Uh, Brentford won, Palace won. Uh, Jeremy is rather uh, innovatively written on our uh, running order. Great goal from Sharda. that's about it. Um, we probably <laughs> should mention the goalkeeper Flecken, who's actually played quite well uh, recently for, for Brentford. He was a little bit unlucky with the Anderson goal, um, I thought, but he he's, he's seems a good acquisition. They haven't noticed the absence of David Raya just yet, but we'll follow that keenly. Um, we should focus on Everton. It's their worst start in 33 years. Booed off. Uh, we made the point last week on the Premier League All Access podcast that this is Everton. They get rid of a manager. They bring a new manager in. That new manager is the Messiah. Then they're woeful again. Um, then they sack him. Then they get a new manager and it's rinse and repeat and it happens over and over and over again. But they need goals. Will Beto provide the goals and the focal point that they need, Crook? Well, what was weird about this game is for two teams who are shot shy, there were so many chances. You know, it, it could have ended up 3 3. Shots, nine on target, seven big chances, but just the one goal. Yeah. Um, so I guess if they can create, keep creating Everton and, and Beto can come in and, and prove himself in the Premier League, and that will give them a little bit of, of confidence. What would worry me for Everton is you target certain games over the course of the season. They've blown two of those already, losing at home to Fulham and Wolves, two teams that you're going to be competing with to stay in the Premier League. I think it's a really poor start. I'm delighted for Gary O'Neill and uh, delighted for Kalajic as well, who had that horrible injury. He's almost going to be like a, a new signing. It was the most fortuitous of goals. I'm not sure what part of his anatomy it hit. I'm not sure he knew it either. But it feels like a big win for Wolves. I think Everton are spending a lot of money on Beto. It's a big gamble. Yeah, and do they have to gamble at this stage, Scott? 
Yeah, well, they do, they do, they do, because goal scoring we know is a massive, massive problem. You know, the, the stats show that actually Everton didn't play that bad, or suggest they didn't play that bad, and they created chances, but they need someone to stick the ball in the back of the net, which with Calvert Lewin injured, and for how long I'm not sure. You know, even we can't rely on him throughout the whole season, so they absolutely need to gamble and. It's a shame, but, you know, you, I, I think for the goal, Jordan Pickford's got to come out and claim that one, you know, and, and you're wanting your, one of your senior pros to be absolutely on it. And the goalkeeper, the cross comes in, whatever you do, if you can't score, don't lose. Keep that clean sheet. Um, really pleased for Gary, as, as Crookie said, but, and he's absolutely spot on. There's a couple of games there where you're thinking you need to get at least a point, if not all three, at home. And the pressure's going to start to build even earlier than last season. Jose Sartre, man of the match, making seven saves, including an incredible one from Decor, and that was absolutely brilliant. But I heard that Nottingham Forest are going to have a little dabble on Jose Sartre. I mean, Wolves surely aren't going to want to leave, lose him at this stage, are they, Crook? No, I think they want to get him tied down to a new contract. Actually, there, there was strong interest from Forest earlier in the window. I think at that stage, Wolves, with their financial issues, were, were thinking maybe we should cash in. But I think if they sell Nunes, as looks likely, then I don't think they're going to self saw again, not to a relegation rival, not at this stage of the window. Yeah, um, Sean Dyche, I think, was a little bit concerned about the way his team has started this season. But uh, look, at the end of the day, it's still a long way to go, but they've got to find goals from somewhere. Maybe this Udinese striker, Beto, 25 years of age, six foot four. Brazilian got 10 goals last season, 11 the season before. He's already off and running in the Coppa Italia. This campaign may be the answer. Everton fans will certainly hope so, although I don't think they'll be... Uh, holding their horses just yet because they'll be thinking to themselves, well, we've seen all this before and it does seem to be sort of history repeating itself. But that's it from us. Uh, we'll be back on Thursday afternoon previewing all the weekend action. Remember uh, that there's Carabao Cup football live on TalkSport and TalkSport 2 this week, Tuesday and Wednesday. Scott and I are going out together on Wednesday night. We're going to Chelsea FC Wimbledon. We're looking forward to that. In fact, Cookie's coming to that as well. That's got disaster written all over it. All three of us being at the same game. That's it. That's that, that's going to be a problem. Um, and uh, we'll be back on the podcast on Thursday. Make sure you rate and review and tell everybody about it. Uh-huh.